It's good to greet you once again, those of you who are listening on Life Radio and Miramichi, and some of you are watching us on YouTube. This is uh, the Sunday morning worship service at the Lower Derby United Baptist Church in Lower Derby, New Brunswick, just outside the city of Miramichi. And we're delighted that you tune our way and listen to the Word of God with us. We invite you, if you live in the area, to come join us some Sunday at Lower Derby. The service starts at 10.30. It's a one-hour service, and we would love to have you with us on any given Sunday. If you have a Bible handy, would you get your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter 4 as we look at another of the miracles that God performed through God's servant, Elisha. We are calling this series Contact Tracing uh, for God's Servant, Elisha. And today we are at 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38, and, and down through to the end of chapter 4. Before we look at that, let's bow our heads, please, for a moment of prayer. Father in heaven, thankful that we can open your word. And thankful that the Holy Spirit resides in our hearts and ask today that you'll teach us your word. Help us to learn from these stories that we read, these miracles that were performed in the Old Testament. Lord, we read in, in your word in Romans that the things that happened before happened for our learning. And that, Lord, we pray that we will gain much today for our lives spiritually as we walk with you from these wonderful stories. And Lord, if there's anyone who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, may they see him today in a new and a fresh way, and may they be drawn to trust Christ as their own Savior. I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. According to modern thought, there are some foods that we eat that are miracle foods. A miracle food is a food that has the ability to revert the aging process. I, I want to know what the miracle foods are because I'm trying to get younger instead of getting older. Maybe you're on that same mission. But a miracle food also is one that uh, causes us or makes it easy for us to lose weight. And then a miracle food is also that which is a cure or a preventative to getting diseases. And we are told that there are a number of foods on the market today that really will aid us in this cause. And that's why they call them miracle foods. Uh, the first one that's always mentioned is the one blueberries. They're rich in antioxidants and, and they're kind of like tomatoes and pink grapefruit and pomegranates. They're loaded with antioxidants and they carry protection and they particularly are good, they say, for the heart. And then of course there's avocados. Uh, they contain uh, antioxidants and they fight disease. And then they tell us that we should drink a lot of water because that helps us with uh, not gaining so much weight, helps us with headaches and joint stiffness. Then they talk about green tea. That's the fourth one on the list. And it's an antioxidant, lowers cholesterol, and it's supposed to uh, uh, really help us to release stress hormones, that kind of thing. And then the big thing today you see in the supermarkets is soy. It's supposed to help with bone density and uh, it's supposed to uh, ease some symptoms for ladies of menopause. Then there's broccoli. <laughs> we're told that we should have two and a half cups of broccoli per, uh, per week, and that reduces the risk of some forms of cancer. My doctor has told me that I should eat lots of fresh salmon. He said that helps your mind, it helps your memory, it regulates your blood pressure, and it helps to keep your cholesterol lower. And then the last one is nuts, miracle food. Now it's just certain nuts, not peanuts. Uh, almonds and walnuts reduce the risk for developing type 2 diabetes and, and also help, if you have diabetes, help to keep your sugar down and they lower cholesterol. Well, that's our little dietitian health talk for today. I'm going to move away from that and I do want to talk about miracle food because the passage of scripture that before us this morning has to do with miracle food and we need to get right into that. We're in the middle part of the life of, of Elisha, God's servant. And we're going to look today at miracle number eight and miracle number nine in his ministry. And it starts out here in verse 38 says, he returned to Gilgal. Now you need to understand the real significance of Gilgal. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they wandered around for 38 to 40 years. Then they crossed the Jordan River. And the first place they stopped when they crossed the Jordan River was Gilgal. And if you were to go to Gilgal, you would notice there's two monuments there. There's one monument on the shore, and there's one monument out in the middle of the river to mark the place where God performed a miracle and the children of Israel came across and into the promised land. Gilgal is where they circumcised all of the, all of the males who had been born in the wilderness. 
It was the place where they started to keep the Passover again. It was the place where they tasted of the corn of the land of Palestine. And of course, it's the place where the manna ceased. You remember when they were in the wilderness, God fed them with manna and quails. And now when they get across the river and they get into Gilgal, the edge of the Holy Land, uh, the manna ceased. And there's a number of lessons here that happen uh, right here in Gilgal. It says that uh, Elisha returned to Gilgal and there was a famine in the land. Let me talk first of all about the thirst. It's very interesting if you have a different translation of the scriptures, if you have the old King James, it, it says there was a dirt in the land. Uh, it's an interesting Hebrew word. It's a simple spelling word. It's, it's R-A-A-B. That's the Hebrew word. And of course, it refers really to, to famine of, of a food and, and, and perhaps even to a lack of water. According to Ezekiel 14.21, the Lord sends four severe judgments. And those judgments are, according to Ezekiel 14, the sword, the famine, wild beast, and pestilence. Now, my generation and all of us who live in Canada, we haven't experienced very, very much of this. I've never experienced a famine. And uh, I, I think maybe in the day and age in which we live with, with COVID-19, we're experiencing somewhat of a, what might fall into the, under the category of pestilence. When I think of famine, it always takes me to the life of uh, Joseph. Remember Pharaoh had a dream uh, when Joseph was in prison? And the dream was there was going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And you know the story. The Bible says it was, it was widespread throughout the whole earth. Now, whether that refers to the, the whole earth as we know it or, or the world of, of their day, the land of, of Israel and Egypt, I'm not just sure. But there was a, that was the reason that, God, uh, that Jacob sent his sons down into Egypt where Joseph provided food for them because there was a famine in Israel. If you've been around people who are starving and in some of the travels I've had, I've seen starving children, gaunt children, uh, swollen bellies, dehydrated bodies, a blackened eye sockets and, and, and sunken in eyes. I remember being in, in, um, in Kamasi in Ghana, Africa. Uh, after speaking for an hour in a service, I went for a walk while the second speaker spoke and a little boy came up to me with a, with a little wooden box. And uh, he said, uh, in his way of speaking, he said, Missa, I shine your shoes. And uh, my shoes were fine. I told him, I said, my shoes are fine. And he looked up at me with a, a, a sober face and he said, Mister, I'm hungry. And I quizzed that little boy. That little fellow hadn't eaten for, for almost four days. And I, I said, I have nothing to give you to eat. I've already eaten my lunch, but you meet me tomorrow right here on the street and I will have food for you. And he wanted to know what about his friend that was with him. And I said, I will have food for you and I will have food for your friend. And the next day they came at the prescribed time and sat right down on the dirt road there. And uh, I had, had been given a lunch and I took half my lunch and gave it to him. And my partner who was speaking at that conference with me, I told him, I said, I gave away half your lunch too. <laughs> and I took half it. So each boy had a lunch and uh, it, it's something to see starving people. Uh, I'm told that people who go through a famine and are hungry for a long time don't grow to be as tall. I'm told, too, that their, uh, their productivity is, is not what it should be as far as working is concerned, and the mortality rate is high. In the New Testament, there was someone who got involved in a famine. Do you remember the prodigal son? Said he wanted his inheritance, left, went out into the far country, and ended up eating the food that the pigs ate, right? He, he knew what a famine was all about. You know, in the Bible, when a famine is mentioned, it's divine judgment on sin. Natural disasters are times in the Old Testament when people were to cry out to God and they were to assess their, their spiritual condition, the condition of their lives. Uh, it seems in our day that God's never considered. Uh, I, I, I watch a lot of news and, and I have never heard a member of parliament or the prime minister of Canada say to, say to us as, as members of Canada, uh, it would be good for those of you who are people of faith to pray to God about this COVID-19. It's never been mentioned. But in the Old Testament times when these things happened, they were allowed by God for people to assess their lives. Uh, listen to what it says in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will send a famine in the land. It says, not a famine for bread, 
nor of thirst for water, but for hearing the word of the Lord. I know that these words were given to Israel, but I believe we're kind of in that situation today. We don't have a famine for bread. We don't have a famine for water, but we have a famine for hearing the word of the Lord. You talk to people about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Everybody says, oh, I'm spiritual, you know, I'm spiritual. They have their what they call their own spirituality. They make up their own religion and their own dogma, and they reject the Bible. Are, are you aware of this fact? That not every building that is called a church that has stained glass windows and a steeple on top preaches the word of God. Are you aware of that fact? Because if, if you're not aware of that fact, you need to be made aware of that fact. Do you know the people who were the furthest away from God in the days of the New Testaments? They were the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were away from God. And in our day, religion is, a, there's a dearth in the land. A, a, a dearth of, of hearing the scriptures and the word of God. Now notice verse 38. It says, Elijah returned to Gilgal, family land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him because there was a, a Bible college there. There were what they called the schools of the prophets that Samuel had founded. And there was one in Gilgal. And, and obviously, Elisha is traveling about and he's at the college now and he's speaking. And he looks to his servant, whose name we know from previously, his servant's name was Gehazi. And he says, put on a big pot and let's have a stew. There's a famine. We got to feed these guys that are in Bible school training. Uh, put on a big pot. Let's have, they're going to have a vegetable stew. Now, it says, and one of the students wanted to contribute to the, to the meal. And he went out into the field to gather herbs. You know, some people like that. I had a distant relative just now passed on to heaven. And she used to know what you could eat. And she'd go out and at a certain time she'd pick dandelions and she'd pick this kind of a mushroom and that kind of a thing and put it all together and eat it. Um, I never had much of a stomach for anything that she picked and ate, but she thought it was delicious. Matter of fact, I can remember her offering dandelion sandwiches. And uh, like I said, it wasn't exciting for me. But anyway, one student went out in the field and he found a wild gorg and gathered from it a lap full of a wild gorgs off of his vine. And it says, and came and sliced them into the pot. He didn't know what it was, but he just seemed to look at it and figure it must be all right. It must be all right to eat. <laughs> wow. What was that? What was this uh, wild vine? I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, I was reading one of the old writers named Herbert Lockyer, and he said it refers to likely to wild cucumber. I wasn't sure that there was such a thing, but nonetheless, that's what some people, it was an uncultivated thing, something that grew wild in the field. Now, after this was sliced and put into the pot, and they started to eat this, uh, uh, I suppose what they were anticipating was delicious vegetable stew, they recognized that something was wrong. There was death in the pot. Now, what, what does that mean? Does it mean when they, when they tasted it, it was bitter? Does it mean it gave them stomach or nausea? I don't know. Uh, did, did they vomit? Did they have cramps? Did they get diarrhea? Uh, did they start to sweat? Did they get hallucinations? Did they have convulsions? Uh, did someone go into uh, some kind of a spell or a coma? I, I, I don't know. But I know here that, that what they put in the pot obviously had contaminated the stew. Someone has said, be careful of, of uh, mushrooms. Some mushrooms you can eat. Some mushrooms are poison. Was this what they gathered? I don't know. I will say this. When, whatever they picked out in the field must have had a resemblance to other things they had eaten before that were good. If, if this was some kind of a, a wild thing growing in the field that they had uh, never seen before, they would have been reluctant to, to take it. But they must have kind of recognized it or thought it was similar to something that you could eat out of the field. That's the problem with, with our day and, 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 and religion. Oh, I want to tell you, friends, that's a real problem. This, this wild, wild gourd, this wild vine they picked gourds off and put in, speaks of a false teaching. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, it says this uh, in the parable of the wheat and the tares. And we learned that it was hard to distinguish between the true and the false. In our day, it's hard to distinguish between the true and the false. That's biblical. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. It says, and, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. We live in an era when it's hard to tell who is genuine and who is telling the truth. 
And who is not counterfeit? Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things, hold fast what is good. There must, uh, you can't sometimes tell always by listening to somebody uh, because they're so, they're so careful with their words. Wow, we need to be more like the, the New Testament Berean Christians in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. It says, these were fair-minded, more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see if what was being heard was really so according to the Bible. In Matthew chapter 24, it says this, in the last days, there will be false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and deceive many, and if possible, even deceive the elect. It says in Proverbs chapter 23, when you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider what's put before you. Can I say, when you sit down to listen to a speaker, consider carefully what is put before you. It says in Psalm 141, Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity and do not eat of their delicacies. Be careful what you take from them. Paul said to the Thessalonians, he said, neither at any time did we use flattering words. People use flattering words today. I remember some time ago being in the garage to have the oil changed in my automobile. And uh, while I was sitting in the waiting room, I picked up a book that was there. And it was a book on reincarnation. You know, saying that the per person writing the book said he'd been here before. And, and you know, he's going to come again. One time he was here as an elephant. Next time he's coming to fly all the crazy stuff. And, 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 he, and then he had a chapter in which he was, said he was going to prove it from the Bible that reincarnation was so. And you know what he said? He said, it says in the New Testament that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. He said, there it is, that's reincarnation. And he said, does not the Bible say ye must be born again? You see, you see, they were using the phrases that we all look for, but they were attaching different meaning to the phrases. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful. Are we able to distinguish between what is helpful for the soul and what is harmful for the soul? Is, there a, is your spiritual palate able to distinguish between error and truth? Can you detect Satan's poison and distinguish it from the sincere milk of the word? Oh, it says in Mark 4, take heed what you hear. Now, so we got this poison to... We got this poison sick vegetable stew here. What are we going to do? Look what it says, verse 40 says, Man of God, there's death in the pot. I kind of think they must have shouted that out. And they say, Elisha, uh, there's death in the pot. We can't eat this. And Elisha said, then bring me some flour. And he put the flour in the pot and then it was fine to eat. I believe the flower here is a, is a symbolic, is an emblem of the, of the written and living word of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you know the book of Leviticus, you know in the book of Leviticus, there are a number of, of offerings that people were to make for the Lord. And one of them was the meal offering. And that meal offering, of course, pictured the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to be safeguarded against error, against evil, is to know the word. That's the only way. It's the word of God that safeguards us from evil. We need to stick solely to the word. Now, some churches you go, you'll feel good when you leave because you have, you have, you have a little psychological pep talk. Uh, and, and, and that's fine. Maybe some people at some time need a psychological pep talk. But when you go to church, please go where the word is exalted and where Christ is spoken of and where the cross is central. Don't just go somewhere to be entertained and to feel good. So important. Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful. Ministers to us. All scriptures give my inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It says in Psalm 119, uh, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Boy, do we, do we need the word of God. So here's what is happening in uh, Gilgal. 
Elisha is there and he's speaking at this uh, at this Bible college, this Bible institute, Bible school. And uh, after he speaks for a while, he knows the guys are hungry because there's a famine in the land. And he says to Gehazi, uh, come on, get a big pot. We're going to we're going to feed these guys. By the way, there was a hundred uh, there in Bible college, says in the passage. And, uh, and, and so they did. And one fellow wanted to contribute, went out in the field and found a wild vine and, and took off some gourds off it and sliced and put it in the pot and, and destroyed the stew. <laughs> and they ate it and, and uh, something happened. Uh, and they were almost, uh, uh, they couldn't eat it. They were, they were going to make them all sick. And, and, and Elisha said, uh, bring me some flour. And he threw the flour in. And the flour, uh, by the miraculous power of God, uh, so what do we say? Purified or decontaminated uh, the stew, and they had uh, and they had stew to eat. So, if you want to know, if you want to know if someone's speaking the truth, it, you you stick to the book. You stick to the book. And please understand that this book is is not on par with the Book of Mormon. This book is not on par with the teaching of Baha'i. This book is is not on par with with those who who have other religious books. The Bible is the only book in the world that is inspired by God. And the Bible is the word of God. The Bible does not contain the word of God. Because if we said that, that would mean that the Bible contains the word of God and it could contain something else. The Bible is the word of God. From cover to cover, it is the word of God. It is the truth that will set you free, that will save your soul, that will guide your life. And we need, that's what we need today, the word of God. Now, as uh, this pot of stew was fine to eat, notice that there was a man that came from uh, Baal. And I'm not, as I said, I'm not sure how to say uh, uh, Shalista. Uh, now, where you say, where is Shalista? Nobody knows where it is. Uh, Bible scholars that I've read, and I've been to Holy Land a few times, uh, they seem to think it's up in the area where Jacob's well was, uh, Sychar, up, up in that area. But nobody seems to know where it was. But we know that the community had been influenced by false teaching because in front of the name of the community, they put the word Baal. Baal. Now, I don't want to go, I don't want to go too heavy here, but you remember when the kingdom was divided into the north and south kingdom, the king that, that took over was a fellow by the name of Jeroboam, and he introduced calf worship. Remember that? Because he didn't want the people to go down to Jerusalem to worship. So he introduced calf worship. That's what happened when the kingdom was divided. The eighth king of the king of, of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel was a guy by the name of Ahab. And Ahab married a woman by the name of Jezebel. And Jezebel's father was a pagan priest of Baal. So in the northern kingdom of Israel, there were two false religions. There was the worshiping of the calf or the cow, and then there was the worshiping of Baal. And communities that, that bought into the whole false religion thing were often named after that religion. And so here, the, the word Baal is in front of the name of the community. So it says there was a man who came from this pagan community. It says, and he brought the man of God, that's Elisha, bread of the first fruit. Now what's that? bread of the first fruit. Well, when you planted a field, and when the field was just starting to get ripe, you were supposed to go out and collect the first fruits, a sample of what was growing in the field, and take it and give it to the priests. That's how the priests got their food. And now, in, in the northern kingdom of Israel, there were no godly priests. All the good priests had left and gone south. So, this guy gathered up the first fruits, and he brought it to one of the schools of the prophets in Gilgal. And he gave it to Elisha. And he said, uh, here, here's bread. So they had stew that they made that was purified. And now they have, now they have bread. And notice what it was. It says it wasn't, a, did I read here 12? Yeah, 12 loaves of barley bread. Wow, that must have been good. I could use a slice of that now. It says, and he brought some corn that he hadn't made into bread in his knapsack. And he said, give it to the people. And Elisha said, said give, give it to the people. Elisha didn't hoard it. He figured, probably figured, I can't eat 12 loaves of bread. It'll go moldy before I ever get, get that gone. And, and so he gave it to the people. And uh, 100 of the prophets, they, they ate. Uh, compare this. Remember the, remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000? There's a lot of similarities here. Do you remember in the feeding of the 5,000, there was 5,000 men, right? Plus women and children. Here there's only 100 men. 
You remember how in the feeding of the 5,000, there was five barley loaves and two fish. Remember that? Here there's 20 barley loaves. Do you remember in the feeding of the 5,000, Andrew said, what are these among so many? And here Gehazi said, what do you mean? Look, look, 20 loaves of barley bread, that won't go anywhere among 100 men. He, he was kind of full of unbelief too. And remember that the apostles in the New Testament handed out to the 5,000 and here God's uh, servant uh, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, handed it to them. And, and in the New Testament, there were 12 baskets left over and here there was food left over. Isn't that amazing? It, it, it's amazing how these things go together. But what, what, what I want to get across this morning is this. There was one man living in a community in northern Israel who was a bright light, who was standing out for God. He wasn't worshiping Baal and he wasn't worshiping the cows. He lived in a wicked and a perverse society, but he was going to live for Jesus Christ. Well, we don't live in a, we don't live in a very godly world anymore, do we? Listen to the news. Listen to the way people speak. Listen to, the, listen to their language. Look at their lifestyles. We live in a, in a pretty pagan place. Matter of fact, if you speak up and, and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ to people, they will laugh and, and they will poke fun of you, make fun of you. I was reading just, uh, well, actually it was just early, early this morning. I, I went on to see if I had any messages on Facebook and, and I saw one of my friends who, was, who was, was interacting to a man who was making fun of the Bible and said that the Bible was just a book of myths and that it had been, been written and concocted just to get people uh, to control them in society and to make them act better and didn't believe that the Bible was the word of God. Are, are, how are you? How, how am I doing? Are we compromising in the world in which we live? Or are we standing to live for Jesus Christ? I don't even know the name of this guy. This guy from this community. I don't, his name is not given. But I know one thing. He influenced many people. And he didn't compromise. He lived for the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine the blessing in the lives of at least 100 men because this man had a faithful testimony. Gathered up the first fruits, made some bread, brought it down and gave it to the Bible college, gave it to Elisha. And all of these young men were blessed. Can I just say this? Be faithful to Christ where God's planted you. You say, oh yeah, great talk about that. Yeah, you don't work in my office, Pastor. <laughs> if you worked in my office... You'd find a, you, you wouldn't be speaking that way. Maybe it's tough in your office. Can I just ask you to be faithful where God's planted you and leave it to God to perform miracles in people's lives. You just be faithful. Oh yeah. This man acted in obedience to the word of God and God blessed. You and I act in obedience to the word of God and God will bless Food was produced. These guys had vegetable stew. And what stew they would have in bread? And God provided. And they had bread. How about you? What are we doing? What are we doing for the cause of Christ? What is our testimony like? Does it not say in Matthew, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Wow. Important to live for Jesus Christ. Be a light in a dark world. Be a Christian in an ungodly world. Stand for Christ. Have a testimony. And let God work through your life to reach other people. Father in heaven, how thankful we are for these wonderful stories uh, from the life of Elisha and how you provided for him Especially, Lord, when he was at this Bible, uh, this Bible school. And how you, uh, Lord, you, you purified the pot of stew by putting in the flour. Thank you that as we stick to the scriptures and to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can know the truth and the truth will set us free. We can follow you and be a testimony for Jesus Christ. And Lord, for this faithful man who came down from, the, from a pagan community in northern Israel, uh, he lived for you despite what was going on in his community. God, may we have some backbone in our day to live for Jesus Christ where you have placed us. I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.